Hello and welcome again to Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick. We are on tour. We are in Amsterdam at the Rai, the big exhibition centre here. We're at Broadband World Forum 2014 and I'm delighted to say that I'm sat here talking with Dr. Farid Mohamed Sani, Farid Sani, who is Chief Strategy Officer, which is a big job at TM Group, and TM of course stands for Telecom Malaysia. That's right. Farid, welcome. Thanks for dropping by to talk to us. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting. Big job, big country, a lot of people. Um, where do you start? What is your basic strategy at TM Group now? Okay, Telecom Malaysia as it stands today is a domestic, primarily a domestic fixed line operator. Uh, our primary uh, offerings is of course by now broadband. Of course, we started off with uh, standard voice services and, and things like that, where we transformed ourselves around mid 2000, you know, uh, or, or that, dec that, that decade. Yeah. And we switched over to broadband, where we've almost completely transformed our network to an IP based network, uh, and, you know, uh, so on and so forth, which is, uh, which is not uncommon, I suppose, uh, uh, worldwide, globally. Uh, what's unique about Telecom Malaysia is, of course, Telecom Malaysia is perhaps the only two in the world uh, operator uh, that is um, call it domestic incumbent if you will that does not have mobile operations uh, bt and us that's uh, right comes to mind <laughs> <laughs> but bt gave theirs away bt gave theirs away yeah. we spun ours off right. into asiata yeah as, as, as yeah. some some might, might be aware of so what what holds in the future is of course now that we've transformed ourselves uh, to become a major broadband uh, driving force in the country, uh, we believe that we need uh, to complement our service offerings to become more comprehensive in our set of access technology. Um, so, so several things we're doing. So, so one is around the access technologies. Um, number one is we are venturing back into uh, the mobile broadband space, but I emphasize it's not mobility we're looking for. We are looking for complementarity with our fixed line services because we want to be the primary uh, convergence operator uh, in the country. So, so one is uh, diversification, if you will, diversification of access technology for convergence. Uh, number two is in our existing core business, which is uh, FTTH and ADSL type broadband, uh, we are doing also two things. Uh, we are going to expand the next 24, 36 months, uh, our FTTH offerings, uh, currently branded Unify. So we are expanding it to many more state capitals around, around the nations. So we are expansion. Secondarily, we are deepening the relationship with the customer base. And what do we mean by that? We are aggressively upgrading them, uh, having more share of wallet with the customers, you know, uh, building a deeper trust-based relationships with the, with, with, with the customers. So. So, in a nutshell, at the uh, telco layer, if you will, we're doing three things, therefore. Complementing our access technologies, broadening our uh, high-speed service offerings, and deepening our relationship with the customers. So, that is us in respect to being a traditional, quote-unquote, telco. Okay, now, how do you determine your strategy? Is it thrust upon you by events? Mm. Are you more reactive? Are you proactive? And if you're proactive, which sort of signals do you pick up on and say, right, I think, mm. or we think, we should be going this way? Um, truth of the matter is, uh, it's a bit of both. There is no such thing as a purely proactive strategy because being proactive needs to take into account the events of the day Absolutely. and anticipating the future. The anticipation of the future is where the proactiveness comes in. So let me talk about, for example, our Unify program or high-speed broadband program. Mm. Uh, that was a in reaction to uh, customer demands at that point in time. Uh, customers were demanding more from our ADSL service. Uh, ADSL technology at the time was not yet economically competitive vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fiber to the home technologies. Of course, by now it, it's, it's evolved a lot more. Um, and it's also in reaction to uh, national objectives and national agenda to, 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 to uplift uh, the, the knowledge-based economy of uh, Malaysian people. Now, the proactiveness is in engaging with the, with the government, engaging with the regulators, 
in figuring out how do we serve all this demand. You know, uh, so the solutions we came up with, the, the architecture, the arrangements, etc., etc., was was fairly innovative. So that's where the proactiveness comes comes in. So in truth, it's it's a bit of both. So that's us again as a as a as a traditional telco. Now we are taking another proactive step, where we are developing this concept called innovation exchange, where we believe that as a telco we need to embrace other providers. We need to, and by other providers, I mean other players that ride and reside on top of our connectivity services. So you're talking about the dreaded OTT players, among others. Yeah. Uh, you know, be it uh, international large OTT players, even uh, domestic startups. We need to start figuring out a way to work together uh, uh, to really have a real relationship, uh, value-creating relationship. Uh, a simple thought experiment would be something like this. Would a telco come up with a solution like Uber? Can a telco ever come up with a solution such as that? Um, mm, that's a good point. In all likelihood, it's unlikely. Having said that, is it useful to have relationships with companies like this? Like, like you know, not, not necessarily just Uber, but all sorts of companies. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we believe the answer is yes. If that's the case, what is the model going forward? So we're coming up with this concept called innovation exchange where it's about us creating not just creating but participating and driving the total ecosystem of not just connectivity but connectivity content device uh, and so on and so forth so that that would be our gameplay because at the end of the day connectivity is meaningless without people valuing what goes inside the connectivity what about your relationship with the government and the regulators? You mm. mentioned the regulators. Mm. Um, how does it work? Because in, in, as you're well aware yourself, in different parts of the world, the relationship with the government and with the regulators differs greatly. Sure. What's yours like? I believe the relationship today is a very positive, productive one. Which is not to say we always agree with the regulators, which is not to say that the regulators always agree with us. Uh, uh, but the framework that we Malaysians take is, is a very pragmatic approach. Uh, perhaps in some other jurisdiction, uh, the view is that one party must be in conflict with the other in order to keep checks and balance. Mm. That's one approach. Yep. The approach we tend to take in Malaysia is to have common goals. If you and I have a common goal, why don't we work together to achieve that common goal? in our respective domains mm. and the question then becomes how do we align incentive structures so that the common goal becomes a common goal so that's the approach we have tended to take in malaysia in many things including the telecommunications industry so if you look at our uh, high-speed broadband initiative a lot of it you know was designed so that you know we have common goals of course goal common goals comes with it common carrots and common um, Penalties, yeah. which can be yeah. onerous, <laughs> <laughs> but, yes. but 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 fact of the matter is, you know, we try not to have a hostile relationship because, you know, a hostile relationship will have other side effects such as wanting to hide things, you know, you know, spending years and years debating, you know, Article A of Section Seven, etc., <laughs> etc., which is which is a meaningless debate. Yes, absolutely. Why do we not have that debate? You know dig up the roads, lay the fibre, connect up the customers. Can I ask you about also something that's obviously striking about Malaysia is there are cities, big cities where infrastructure is getting better and better. You have your own link from the airport down into KL, Kuala Lumpur. You've got your, your, your I don't know, I can't remember what you call it, but there's that sort of fast internet access area along the mm. road there. Mm. And MSC. Hope, no, thank you, that's it, thank you. I've forgotten it. And um, in the big cities, so there's, there's density of population, mm. but because it's dense, rather like any other, like Hong Kong, for example, anything like that, you have the soul, you have the ability to do something about it. We've got vast rural areas as sure. well, where there are jungle, where there's jungle, where there's mountains, sure. where there's rivers, and that makes the provision of basic, even basic telecom services very difficult. Where does your emphasis lie, and what are you doing about the rural stuff? Okay. Um, I suppose in this regard, you know, I have to represent myself as a Malaysian, as a, as, as, 
uh, yeah. as, as someone who participates very actively in the Malaysian uh, telecommunication industry, uh, which is not necessarily primarily the, 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 the role of Telecom Malaysia itself. Now, if you look at our national broadband plan, uh, which was launched uh, circa 2007 or 2006 thereabouts, uh, we actually segmented the country into three. Uh, what we call Zone 1, which is the high economic impact areas. Zone 3, which is the areas what, uh, that, 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 that you talked about, you know, uh, rural areas, uh, areas where there's, uh, that there's low affordability, high cost to serve, etc., etc. And then what we call Zone 2, which is basically intermediate between Zones 1 and Zone 3. Uh, geographically, these would be suburbans, you know, areas outside, just outside the, the, the high economic impact zones, you know, secondary towns, etc., etc. So what we said was in zone two, uh, the demand is there. Uh, the, the, the demand is there such that the natural course and speed of market dynamics would mean that uh, customers will be able to enjoy a reasonable uh, quality of broadband with reasonable speeds. Uh, we, we call that facilities-based competition where people can access ADSL, can access 3G HSPA, WiMAX, etc, etc, what have you. And then in Zone 1, where in addition to this natural course of, of market dynamics, we said that in Zone 1, we need something more. We, right. need, we, we needed something more where we felt that you know, we needed to, to, to have a more supply-led uh, strategy. Uh, of course, being supply-led, and, and then all the players in Malaysia are primarily uh, companies and therefore have also a profit motive, uh, which is enshrined by law. Mm. Uh, that's the nature of companies. In order to be supply-led, then there needs to be a co-investment co uh, being, being done with the government. So that's where our high-speed broadband initiative came in, which is our fibre to the home program. Because you know, if you do the calculations, it is impossible for any commercial entity on its own to justify such investments. So what we did was to work with the government, yep. uh, figure out you know what is that gap, close that gap, and such that you know. So so we have the government fulfilling its objectives, the commercial entities fulfilling its objectives, the people getting what it needs. So that's how we solve Zone One. Uh, and when I say the industry getting what it needs, us as the primary provider of, of high-speed broadband, we get access to the co-investment fund, uh, you know, we get customers, etc., etc. And not only that, other industry players get access to our network because in exchange for getting the co-investment, we are then asked to also open up the network. Of course. Uh, yeah. so, so that solves Zone 1. Zone 3 are areas where no amount of facilities-based competition will, will ever allow access. So this is where we have the Universal Service Provision Fund being deployed extremely aggressively, uh, you know, post the heyday of, of, of uh, broadband. Uh, so if you look at the numbers today, you know, uh, by now our broadband penetration rate or take-up rate is of the order of 67, 68%, which, you know, for a country like Malaysia, which is you know, in terms of GDP per capita, much, much smaller than most of Europe. Um, that's a, a sizable, mm -hmm. sizable achievement. It basically means that almost every single living adult in Malaysia has some form of reasonable internet access. What's the population of Malaysia now? 28. And so growing fast. And growing very fast. Yes. Now, We've come to the end of interview in a couple of minutes, but a couple more questions I'd like to ask you. One of which is about technology transformation and business trans transformation. And we're seeing with new technologies like SDN and NFV, mm. software defined networks and network functions, virtualization, mm. enforcing change on structures, mm. not just the technology itself, mm. but because of the difference in the way things will work going forward, sure. it's having an impact on organizational structure mm. um, and the dynamics of organizational change. Mm. What's the, the, the state of play in, in Malaysia? Is, is new technology having an impact on business transformation? And if so, in what way? 
Yes and no. Um, the way we look at it is uh, we try not to be so inward looking in how we think of organization and organization architectures. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, thinking of what's the implication of software defined networks onto our org structure is perhaps a reasonable way of looking at it, but we like to turn it the other way around. We ask, the question we always ask ourselves is, what is the best architecture to serve the customer? We always try to start with the customer base first and then looking inwards into how we organize ourselves. Um, so, so that being the case, we try to look at what we now call lines of business. Yep. Uh, before, two, before 2012 or 2013, around about, yeah, around, around about 2008 to 2012, uh, we changed our architecture from what we, we used to have retail, wholesale, yep. and below that are all the supporting functions, which is basically uh, customer service, network, yep. and then all the corporate functions. Yep. We thought that having a large retail body was too complicated because things get lost in such a large organization. We broke it down into what we call lines of business, which is basically major segments. We had consumer, SME, uh, large enterprise, uh, government, etc., etc. That provided focus into how we serve these market segments. Uh, so it started with, call it front-facing, if you will. So we reformed our organization on the front-facing basis. Over time, therefore around about 2012, uh, we noticed two things. The front was getting more focused. The supporting layers were still getting, uh, w w there's still room for improvement. Uh, but if we broke the supporting layers to such small groupings like we did the lines of business, I think very, very soon everyone will get thoroughly confused. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is impossible to manage Effectively, it's you will break up the network team into eight. It becomes too. It becomes, it becomes micro too management small. too small. Yeah. Too small. So now what we're doing is, so so that's why it's an iterative right. process. Whilst we started from the front, is now impacting our back end, yep. and splitting up the back end to such small groupings is, is impossible. So it's an iteration now. So the, the iteration is the front groupings are being clustered together. So for instance, uh, consumer and SME are essentially using the same product groups. It's right. basically uh, mass market broadband, for example. So those two groupings are being clustered together. Um, uh, large enterprise and government sector essentially uses, again, the similar product groups, IP, VPN, you know, Metro E, yep. things like that. Yep. Yeah. People, that ho people at home would have never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Who, who has heard of IPVPN? <laughs> well, us. <laughs> us. Yeah, but uh. we're in the industry. <laughs> yeah. so, so they are being clustered together. And once you cluster that together, then you have a more logical interface to the customer service groups and the network groups. So that's how we tend to think of organization uh, structures. We tend to think of market in as opposed to uh, technology out. We're going to have to wrap it up because I'm running out of time, but I've got one final light-hearted question to ask you, Farini, if I may. Look, in your job and your board and everybody, they're being bombarded by vendors all the time. Look at this, buy this, have you seen this? Why don't you, I want you to do this for me, all the rest of it. If the boot was on the other foot for once and you were able to ask one thing of the vendor ecosystem, what would you ask for? They should do better by giving me more, better service quality, as free as possible. And by free, I mean free. <laughs> <laughs> Not a small ask then. Not a small ask. A big, a big, big present. Indeed. But, but jo joking aside, yeah. it is actually in response to something real, which is at yes. the end of the day, yeah. uh, revenues are declining uh, globally. Prices are dropping. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, dropping prices and escalating uh, cost to serve, there's only one solution. Somebody, something will break. Absolutely. I would have loved to have gone on talking to you for longer because I was really enjoying it. Fascinating insight. Absolutely fascinating, actually. Farid Sani, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for inviting. Pleasure.
Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff.